What's up? I'm Hutch, and you need to better understand PNF levels of facilitation so that you can more effectively treat your patients and also pass the NPTE. Levels of facilitation are strategies the therapist can use to set up an exercise or activity to make it more effective to accomplish their goal, which is stability, mobility, controlled mobility, or skill. The more of these strategies that you can use at a time, typically the more successful your patient will be to accomplish that goal. First is manual contact. How and where you touch the patient makes a big difference for the activity. Lighter touch can help relax a muscle or decrease pain, whereas firmer touch will increase activation of that muscle you're touching and decrease activation of the antagonist. Body position also makes a big difference. You can use the mat table as a form of contact for the patient. You can use gravity to assist or resist emotion. Your position will also matter. You want to make sure you're in a spot where you're not going to impede their motion, but you can provide appropriate resistance or assistance as needed to accomplish your goal. It's also good to have the patient perform an activity in multiple developmental postures laying down, tall kneeling, quadruped, modified plantigrade will help the patient be able to do this in more ways and have it be a little bit more functional. Visual cueing is important to provide not only a target for the patient but have some feedback so they can see their body part moving throughout space and correct it as it goes. Verbal cueing also makes a big difference and you want to keep these cues as short and direct as possible in order to minimize confusion and them having to really think about what you're saying. Normal Normal timing is something that you're working towards, which is them moving in a smooth, coordinated, unbroken movement, which is how we normally perform activity, but you may have to break this down into segments and then try to add it all together and work out those kinks. Stretch. This is only for non-painful and stable joints. You can perform a quick stretch at the beginning of the range of motion to help initiate the activation of that muscle. You can also perform repeated stretch, which is basically as they're going through a range of motion, if they get stuck at some point, you perform another little quick stretch and that can activate spinal reflexes again to help those muscles activate and get through the next portion of that range of motion. Resistance or assistance. This can be used for evaluation purposes, but it can also be used to help improve strength, control, mobility. Manually, you'll either provide isometric resistance, which is in place, or isotonic resistance, which is an attempt to provide the same level of resistance throughout a range of motion and with the goal of normal timing. Now, just as a sidebar really quick, I want to go over three responses that your body has that you can use to help make your exercises more effective and decide when and where to provide resistance. Irradiation is also known as overflow, which is contraction of other areas. Even if the exercises you're doing is working on one muscle, other areas may contract as well and can get indirectly stronger. Reciprocal inhibition. When you activate a muscle, this automatically deactivates the antagonist. Successive induction. So this is the principle that after max contraction comes max relaxation, but also the antagonist will then be activated. So depending on whether your goal is to stretch or strengthen or improve activation of a certain muscle, you can use these principles to help you out. You can use traction or approximation to either add or take away from the stability of a joint. And finally, you have patterns. So when we're developing as children, the last movements that we can do are cross body or rotational movements. So when we're injured, those are the first things to go and the last things that we're really trying to get back into to make sure you can return to ADLs or sports or whatever you want get back into. We decided on these D1, D2 patterns because they provide the most amount of rotation and cross body movement that we can get with our upper and lower bodies. So you'll have D1, D2 flexion. Those are based on what's happening at your hip or shoulder joint. So if your shoulder is flexed, that's the flexion part of that movement. The other thing to note is that you can have your knee or your elbow flexed or extended. It doesn't make a difference to this movement, just depending on what activities you're trying to get back into. So for your upper body. D1 is like you're sitting in the passenger seat and you're putting a seatbelt on. D2 is like reaching for a jar on the top shelf and then putting it into a side bag. For the lower extremities, D1 is kind of like kicking a ball, whereas D2 I picture more as you're trying to spot clean your floor and you've got a rag under your shoe. That's like the motion that you're making with a, a lower extremity D2 pattern. You can use both sides of your body in a, a bilateral symmetrical or asymmetrical movement. You can have reciprocal with upper and lower body moving at the same time. And the more you start to work with these patterns, the more you see that we do use them in sports and in our daily lives. Now it's time for NPT Jeopardy! 
Pause the video now if you want time to read and think about the question. Otherwise, you've got five, four, three, two, one. So remember that flexion movements are when your shoulder is flexing for the upper body. So you are going to be moving into shoulder flexion. And this is like you're trying to grab a seat belt near your left shoulder if you're using your right hand. Hopefully that covers all of our bases. If not, you can always check out the description box below for a link to my notes on Etsy. Or you can comment with questions or suggestions for videos I should do in the future. Otherwise, good luck studying. Go change the world.